from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. The 2008 Holiday Lectures on Science. This year's lectures, Making Your Mind, Molecules, Motion, and Memory, will be given by Dr. Eric Kandel, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at Columbia University, and Dr. Thomas Jessel, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator also at Columbia University. The first lecture is titled, Mapping Memory in the Brain. And now, to introduce our program, the president of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Thomas Check. Welcome to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the 2008 Holiday Lectures on Science. The Institute initiated this series in 1993. In 1995, I had the pleasure of coming here and delivering the lectures on catalytic RNA. And since I've been president of the Institute, it's been a great pleasure to be involved in choosing 18 terrific scientists to talk to uh, students here in the auditorium. The holiday lectures are one of more than 30 research and education programs of the Institute. And please visit our website, www.hhmi.org, to learn more about all of our activities. This lecture series focuses on the most complex organ in our body and arguably the one that most is responsible for making us human. Clearly, without this organ, you wouldn't be able to find this auditorium. And even if you got here, you wouldn't understand a word that was being said. Clearly, I'm talking about the brain and the nervous system. The nervous system is an extremely complex and sophisticated network of cells, and we've recruited two of the best brains in the field to be our guides. Eric Kandel and Tom Jessel are both longtime Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigators at Columbia University in New York City. In these lectures, Eric and Tom will open a window on cutting edge research into how the brain develops and how it functions to mediate our movements, our perceptions, and our innermost thoughts and memories. It's an honor to introduce Eric Kandel to deliver our first lecture. Eric has been a longtime member of the HHMI community. He's a tenacious and insightful scientist and a tremendously engaging lecturer. He's been recognized and rewarded in numerous ways, including the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2000. In his first lecture, Eric will set up the problem of understanding how the brain works, visiting some high points in the history of neuroscience that have led to our current understanding of the brain. We now have a brief video to introduce Eric Kandel. is heaven. I mean, I like Paris, but there's nothing like New York. And the academic scene in New York, uh, Columbia, NYU, Rockefeller, Mount Sinai, Einstein, it's just absolutely terrific. By the release of chemical transmitted glutamate. I frankly like belonging to a university. Um, I feel there's something uplifting about it. It's a, it's a privileged existence, and Columbia is a very nice place to work. People are very interactive with one another. They're very generous to one another. And it's been very nice to see how neuroscience has grown at Columbia since we came here. It's really a, a terrific community. I, I really love teaching, and I particularly love teaching medical students. Uh, I like the idea of being involved in the training of physicians. And when people ask me about this, I strongly encourage them to teach. Um, First of all, I think it is essential for the scientific community to train other people. It's obvious. Uh, it's also important to learn how to organize one's thought about a topic and to be able to communicate with people who don't know the science very well. Um, we all end up giving lectures, like the holiday lectures, which are designed for 
a general audience and to learn how to communicate your ideas in terms that other people can understand is very important and teaching is very helpful for that. I hope that we excite lots of kids to realize how wonderful science is and how exciting and promising neural science is and we hope we do a good job. Good morning. Thank you very much for your gracious introduction, Tom. Uh, Tom Jessel and I are delighted to have the opportunity provided by these holiday lectures to interact with you over the next two days. In our four talks today and tomorrow, Tom and I plan to give you a sampling of what the modern science of the mind is about and why it has become such a central and exciting area within biology. We begin by asking, what is mind? The major theme of the first lecture, and without doubt the most important discovery in brain science, is that the various functions of mind, thinking, feeling, acting, learning, remembering, creating works of art, are a set of processes carried out by the brain. Mind is the brain is walking its to legs, except infinitely more complex. The brain makes us who we are. It produces our every emotional and intellectual act. The brain determines our moods. It endows us with the capability for great joy and terrible misery. In his two lectures, Tom Jessel will discuss with you how the brain develops the capability for mental function, and once developed, how the brain controls our behavior. I will begin our discussion of mind this morning by considering learning and memory, two of the most magical properties of mind, because they're central to our existence. They make us who we are. They shape our knowledge. Learning, as you know, is the process whereby we acquire new information about the world, and memory is the process whereby we hold on to that information over time. Most of the information we have about the world and most of our skills are not born into our brains, but are acquired through learning. We learn the faces and names of our parents, our sibling, our friends. We learn the logic of algebra, the capability to dance, to engage in sports, to read music, to play the piano, to remember the words of the Star Spangled Banner. As a result of this knowledge acquired by the brain during our lifetime, we are in large part who we are because of what we learn and what we remember. Moreover, tragically, specific disorders of learning and disorders of memory haunt the developing infant as much as the mature adult. Autism, attention deficit disorder, Down syndrome affect the quality of life of young people that suffer from them. At the other end of the spectrum, the normal weakening of memory age and the devastation of Alzheimer's disease haunt the elderly. Indeed, we'll learn this afternoon with our discussions with Jerry Fishback and Kate Jameson that even illnesses that begin in midlife or even earlier, like schizophrenia and depression, have an impact on memory. It's hard to think of a mental disorder that doesn't have one or another effect on memory. We've learned a great deal about normal memory from studying these disorders of memory. We've learned that memory is the glue that binds our mental life together, that without memory, Life is made of a series of disconnected fragments that do not have any meaning in relationship to each other. In fact, life becomes meaningless without the binding force of memory. Imagine life without any memory. Imagine not being able to think where you were last week, last year, not being able to remember the first day you started high school. I'm going to show you an example of life without memory. Clive Waring, a brilliant musician, more than 20 years ago, suffered a serious brain infection, herpes encephalitis, that wiped out his memory. Here is a person whose life is a series of fragments. How many years have I been ill? About 20. About 20. Can you imagine what to have one night 20 years long with no dream? That's what it's been like. Just like death. No difference between day and night, no thoughts at all. In that sense, it's been totally painless which is not something which is very desirable, really, is it? Which is precisely. 